Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where someone vaped americium. When you got to carbon tetrachloride, it piqued my interest. Way back when, when I was in high school, we were using it during a lab. We were all smelling it and talking about how awesome it was. I can't remember what we were actually trying to accomplish in the experiment, but we had some sticky substances that got on our hands and arms. The teachers said we could use the carbon tet to clean it off, but they warned us that there was a possibility that it could be harmful, but there wasn't enough evidence. So basically, we washed our hands and arms with the stuff. It worked well as a solvent. Probably not the best idea, and we went through a ton of that stuff. Yikes, that is crazy. I also know that my dad used copious amounts of it when working at a tire factory for over three decades. He said it was the only thing that would reliably get raw rubber off of the equipment or himself. Now that man has had tons of health issues before he passed, though oddly enough, he didn't have a lot of issues with his liver or kidneys. Can't say the same for about everything else though. So the issue with carbon tet is it's both carcinogenic, but it also causes toxicity of the liver or kidneys. Your dad definitely got pretty lucky to not get affected by it, so that's good. But I would not advocate that anybody uses carbon tet to clean their skin or anything else off. It's also a bad ozone depleter, so you definitely want to avoid it. And it's also a greenhouse gas, if that wasn't bad enough. When I had been the lab supervisor for undergraduate students in inorganic chemistry, my students had to synthesize several inorganic complex compounds. I'm just going to pause here for a sec. So if you're in chemistry and you've wondered why they're called complexes, like we have an inorganic complex, it's because they are complex. That Yes, that is the actual reason. I know. I know. I couldn't believe it either. Why are they complexes? Oh, because they're complex. Come on, guys. One student had to synthesize a copper arsenic compound. He filtered it, took it off of the spatula, cleaned the filter paper, and then took his fingers to clean the spatula. There had been no imminent danger, and I just told the student that he had a copper arsenic compound on his finger and under his nail. Why wasn't he wearing gloves? Like, he should have been wearing gloves. And I asked him what he wanted to do the rest of the day with his finger. Maybe wipe the eye, clean his teeth, pick his nose. I don't know why you would clean off the tip of a spatula with anything other than, like, a Kim wipe or clean it in some solution that would dissolve off the compound of interest. I have never tried wiping off a spatula with my bare fingers ever, but I have cleaned off a spatula many times with thousands of Kim wipes. There's something so funny about a chemist reacting. Well, it is what we do after all. Now the real question is if I'm going to overreact, and if I overreact, I better have a secondary container ready, for what I inevitably do. I work at a mine. I'm in the lab, but they use a stench gas as the warning system in the mines. Radios and phones don't work well underground, and it's loud as heck down there, so sirens don't work either. But when the fresh air gets filled with vomit-inducing smell, it gets the point across to GTFO. They also use an anti-stench after the emergency drill. It's just wintergreen extract. Yeah, I don't think it really works that way. Can you get rid of some of the smell by, like, masking it? Sure, but it's still there. The one thing that this story makes me wonder is, how do they know that the levels of the gas that they put in their warning system aren't toxic? How would they get it, like, just to the right intensity so that they know everybody will smell it, but it won't be, like, more harmful than whatever the issue at hand is? If you have any ideas about this, please let me know down below. Not a chemist, but they were cleaning out the quality test lab at my work, and they had discovered that there had been a glass bottle of fuming nitric acid with a very wonky stopper just chilling out on the top of an 8-foot cabinet in the corner for presumably several years. It's worth noting that the room had ended up just being used for storage and had a ton of cardboard boxes placed directly underneath the bottle. There was also several containers of various solvents stored in flammable cabinet nearby. So I have a story. I don't think I've told this story on the channel before, but we once had a visiting researcher in our lab who was from out of the country. They're from a different country, and they had been working with thionyl chloride as they had to prepare an acyl chloride for one of their intermediates. So after they left, we'd noticed several months later that one of the shelves had just slowly been rusting, and we weren't sure why. This wasn't a shelf in the fume hood. This is just like where we'd keep our lab notebooks or whatever. And it turns out that there had been a glass bottle, an amber glass bottle of thionyl chloride with no lid on, just slowly evaporating away. And so by the time we realized this, the shelf that it was on was totally like rusted to crap. And it was just like a zone of rust that was more intense closer to the bottle and then less intense everywhere else. Now you might be thinking someone should have discovered this a lot sooner, but no one was working in that fume hood for several months, so no one thought to check. So lesson learned, if uh, someone moves on, make sure you check that all of their stuff's been properly taken care of, otherwise they might have left something silly around, and in this case it was nitric acid. In our case, it ended up being thionyl chloride. I have a story from high school, from something called an open door day, a day in high school to show younger kids from elementary school a typical day at the high school. I was 17 at the time. For the chemistry class, this meant to do some cool and simple experiments in the laboratory to show the elementary school kids what cool stuff we do on a daily basis, which we did exactly once a year for this exact occasion. One of these experiments was the reaction of magnesium with hydrochloric acid, showing off the properties of hydrogen, nothing other than the fact that it's explosive. 
I did another experiment, crystallization of lead iodide, but I had a bench just across from the couple guys who had been making the hydrogen. Their setup was to use a boiling flask with some dilute hydrochloric acid, to which they were meant to add a spoon of powdered magnesium, and stopper it with a rubber stopper with a bent glass pipe, whose end was put into a bowl with soapy water. The instructions were clear, put a spoonful of magnesium, which was supposed to be granules, but we didn't have any, in the flask. Stopper it, put the pipe in the soapy water, let some bubbles generate, withdraw the pipe, and ignite the hydrogen bubbles with a match. They were supposed to do this in front of 8 to 10 11 year olds, who weren't wearing any PPE in the lab. Here's what should have happened. The granulated magnesium should start reacting slowly after stoppering the flask, pushing out any air, filling the glass with basically just hydrogen, not making it explosive, as the bubbles were just supposed to be filled with that. Here's what happened. The powdered magnesium reacted almost instantly upon addition, releasing the hydrogen into the lab and making only a small amount of it remaining in the flask after stoppering, mixing with the air. These guys were also not sharp, and skipped the part where they were supposed to withdraw the glass pipe from the soapy water. As the group of kids were standing nearby, I hear the bang, and I could see a piece of glass shrapnel flying in slow motion about 10 centimeters from my neck Oh my gosh. Apparently the explosion from the hydrogen bubbles was somehow able to travel under the water level through the glass pipe into the stoppered 250 milliliter flask with a hydrogen air mixture. Miraculously, no one was hurt. I expected the teacher to scrap the experiment and, and to just ask the two students demonstrating this to leave the lab for the day. Instead, she told them to clean up the mess and to take another 250 mil flask to set up the experiment for the next group of 11 year olds. I was like, all right, lucky them, whatever. The next group of kids come in and the guys do the exact same thing, but as I saw them reaching for the matches without withdrawing the pipe from the soapy water, I just crouched under my bench, making everyone in the lab think that I was crazy. And a second later, there's shrapnel flying across the lab. Whoa, what a surprise. I don't know how the teacher managed to keep her job. Maybe based on the fact that the school is very understaffed in terms of science teachers. Yeah, you know, if you don't learn from the first time, the second time it's your fault. After the students did that once, the fact that the teacher didn't change the experiment or stop it from being done again is definitely negligence on their part. If you have any similar stories, I'd love to hear them down below. Blacksmith here, I once got my forge too hot while smelting because I hadn't built my foundry yet. I ended up boiling lead. I also forgot to dry my ingot mold so it got jumpy. Not my proudest or safest moment. The only metals I've ever melted include bismuth and zinc. Yeah, blacksmithing is definitely a high-risk profession. If you have any good blacksmithing stories, I'd love to hear them. So back in high school, my chemistry teacher asked me to prepare a lab for our class. At the time, we were supposed to be learning about pressure and vacuum, so I thought it would be a great idea to bring a decent size, two-stage vacuum pump in, and a giant bell jar, and hopefully boggle their minds with basic physics. As I was finishing up the vacuum hoses and fittings, the teacher and the school safety officer came in to see what I was making for the class. I thought, wow, here's my chance to impress him, since he's also the history teacher. I placed a buzzer in the jar, and then reached for the the control panel completely forgetting that I had left the vent cap still on the pump. Anyhow, as soon as the safety officer leaned over to observe, boom, that cap made its rapid vertical ascent grazing his hat and proceeded to bounce off the ceiling and walls, just like in the physics cartoons. The man just stared for a hot minute and said, you're doing great, and then left the room. I certainly made history at the school being the first student to shoot at a safety officer. Oh yes, this was definitely a historic occasion. In our tritium lab, we considered T2 gas, which is tritium gas, as dangerous but manageable. You can see it with radiation air monitors, and if you breathe it in, you mostly just breathe it out since it's essentially hydrogen and doesn't really do anything biologically. Our big scary thing is always tritiated water, or tritium on dust particles. The dust can stay in your lungs, which is bad. We also did the maths on pure tritiated water once, and getting a droplet of it on your skin will allow enough of it to diffuse into your body to give you a lethal dose. So if you don't care to prevent T2O formation, T2 does that on its own, radiochemically, when oxygen is present, or if you don't clean dust particles, you might get a nasty surprise. Yeah, I had a lot of comments on a recent video talking about T2 not being that bad, but if you have a hydrogen in the presence of oxygen, it's going to inevitably be forming some T2O, and if the T2 is like adsorbed to a surface, like let's say you have a metal or something, it's just going to stick around for a really long time. So while for a lot of gases that you breathe in, you can just breathe back out. I think there's additional safety concerns here that a lot of people weren't thinking about. A former lab mate of mine was making 246 tris tert aniline following a literature procedure simply reducing one nitro 246 tris tert butyl benzene with LAH. He used an ice bath while slowly adding the one nitro 246 tris tert butyl benzene solution to the LAH suspension within an hour or so. Everything was nice and tame, so he was quite pleased since LAH can be a real issue. However, the ice bath was not mentioned in the literature procedure, for a good reason. It turned out that the reaction does not take place at zero degrees. When he removed the ice bath, the reaction mixture started warming up, and then the reaction started. Within seconds, the reaction went absolutely crazy, and the addition funnel that he was using was flying through the the fume hood like a rocket. Afterwards, the whole fume hood was covered in a dark reddish brown liquid, hexa tert azobenzene, and even after several washings, it was still noticeably orange. Luckily, nobody got injured, and from that day on, we had a fume hood with Mexico filter and rocket scientist in our lab.
in year nine, we were doing a lesson on radiation and our teacher pulled out the Geiger counter so that we could see the effects of different materials in blocking different types of radiation. He told us that he had done this demo before at a boys school and there was a guy who stole one of the radioactive discs and hid it in his pants for the entire lesson. Why would you do that? That's so dumb. What the heck? Just a quick story from our undergrad inorganic lab. We all had to prepare different metal alloys. Mine for this example was a lead tin alloy. Just really basic. Take the elements, melt them in a crucible, pour them on the bench, and send a sample to the elemental analysis to see if it was nice and homogeneous. A friend of mine had found a sample of what was supposed to be bismuth grains for a synthesis. Used it, turned it into the elemental analysis, and they found close to 0% lead content. Did it again. Same results. It turns out that the container was mislabeled and it was actually antimony. Yikes. Much more toxic than bismuth. So he'd been handling toxic antimony absolutely casually because he thought it was just bismuth. He was fine though. Yeah, he's super lucky that he's fine. Antimony metal is terrifying. Today's Yikes Awardee is obviously Throwaway 2, and this wasn't one that somebody submitted. This is a story from Reddit that was posted last week. Someone told me about it in the Discord, and I definitely had to include it. So this is the americium vaping story. I like to tinker with things, and I'm curious how things are put together. Recently, I pulled apart an ionizing smoke alarm to see what's inside, up close and dirty. If you're not sure how smoke alarm works, I'll include a link to a recent Technology Connections video. That's another YouTube creator that goes by TC. I even pulled apart the ionization chamber because I wanted to see what the americium 241 source looked like. I knew I was safe, well, safe-ish, as alpha particles can't penetrate the skin. Job done. I left the piece on my work desk to dispose of later on. I moved on to my next toy, which is a black mamba vaporizer which had just come through the post. I loaded it up with some dry herb and medicated myself. So we actually have a picture of what their americium source looked like. So this is just metal, this is probably stainless steel or nickel, and this disc in the middle is what the americium source is. And so you can see that they've actually dug it out, so they dug out the americium source. Now what's kind of unfortunate is, I guess they have some sort of magnetic material that's like a filler for the disc and so what happened is that is magnetic and then it ended up going and connecting to part of their vaporizer all good so far but what i hadn't noticed was the americium 241 pellet must have somehow attached itself to the magnet clip on the vaporizer and ended up in the burning chamber oh no i thought the hits on the vaporizer had a funny smell and taste but i thought nothing more of it as it's new and it was probably just the protective coating burning off even after i had primed it a couple of times attached a couple pictures of the pellet thingy after being in the vaporizer, the black paint-like stuff in the middle seems grayer or gone. Maybe it's all burned off and vaporized? The vaporizer gets up to 220 degrees Celsius in temperature. So yeah, I think I vaped some americium 241. Do I need to be worried? Yes. Yes, you do. You definitely should be worried. I'm worried. Oh, this story is just so stupid for so many reasons. I don't even know what to say about this, but you shouldn't be playing with americium. And just because something's not that radioactive, doesn't mean it's not a heavy metal. Heavy metals are still toxic in their own right. Sometimes we focus so much on one type of toxicity or one type of hazard that we neglect to recognize other significant properties that can make something really toxic. So yeah, this is an obvious throwaway. And I went and checked and they've posted other posts before, so it seems legit. You can let me know if you think that this is real or not down below, but it seems real. I probably told this story before in a different channel, but here it goes. The dumbest thing I've ever done in the lab. I use dibromoethane a lot in my project for alkylating various compounds. It's a nice high boiling liquid and I can use it neat. It works great for my chemistry, but as always, PIs will tell you it's good, but what if it could be done even better? And so they suggested diiodoethane, which is a solid at room temp. So I decided to do the same reaction that I had been doing, but using a diiodoethane melt. You can probably already tell what's going to happen and why this was an incredibly stupid idea. I checked back on the reaction five minutes later and it is already turned black. I was doing this in a two dram vial and thought, oh well, it was worth a shot and opened the vial to recover the stir bar. Instantly, I hear the loudest, most violent sounding hiss of gas escaping that I have ever heard with such a force that it almost knocked the vial out of my hand and shot the cap about a foot upward. Diiodoethane is an organic source of iodine because it disproportionates into iodine and ethylene gas. I had probably just generated about five atmospheric pressures of ethylene gas before opening the vial. I'm honestly surprised I didn't start a fire with that one. TLDR didn't use Google to check that diiodoethane readily produces ethylene gas. Flashbanged myself. Yeah, uh, that's pretty scary. I'm glad to hear that you're okay after this experience because yeah, that's a really scary experience. I'm more surprised that uh, you were just doing this for alkylation based chemistry and not something like activating a grignard because that's another case where sometimes you'll see people using diiodoethane or dibromoethane. I was about to write a hair pun in the comments, but I've decided to cut it. <laughs> Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.